of what your spiritual journey is. Um, those of you that are able, I want to invite you to stand. Um, and whether you are standing or seated, I want to invite you to channel your inner tree. So those of you that are yogis, uh, you would have to kind of plant your feet, uh, you know, make it a little bit wider than your hips. And yeah, y'all got it. And, and your hands go up. Those are your, your branches. Uh, imagine a stream that's running from the ground up through your spine, up through your head. So you're, and, and up into the heavens as, as your arms are reaching up into the heavens and your feet are, are firmly planted, you're rooted. So you're reaching out, you're rooted, you're grounded, you're reaching out to get some good stretches in. Uh, if your back needs to be a stretch a little bit, you can do a forward fold. Uh, I learned just two weeks ago in my yoga practice that that's a cooling pose. So if you get too hot today, you can just <laughs> do a forward fold. And, uh, and back stretches can, can kind of help get that spine in a different position that it stays in 99.99999% of the time. Good job. Sit down as you are um, able. Well, not that <laughs> way. Where are the workshops? In your program, 
Um, the locations are listed by the workshops. I'm also going to have an easel that states um, when you walk out, it'll at least have section one and two up there with the locations. Um, and if you don't know where the location is, but it says <laughs> the workshop is in, you can ask me or Dennis or the front desk, and we'll kind of just be posted around um, to get you into the workshop location. <laughs> there is just one um, workshop change, which you may have already noticed in your program. Um, many of you are probably aware that Reverend Bruce Gillette is in the process of healing um, from a diagnosis of acute leukemia. And so we hold him in our prayers um, as he and Carolyn are not able to be with us, but he is doing much better already. Um, his, uh, the workshop that they were going to lead was families and creation care. So we are not able to offer that and just invite you to choose another one of the wonderful four options that were needed. And that was going to be during session two. Um, this evening, we're gonna meet back in here at 7 p.m. sharp. So wrap up your dinner again, like last night, um, pretty close to seven, come in here and we'll be zooming in a present presenter from the College of Worcester, who's going to share about the effects of climate change on our mental health and how we as faith leaders um, address our communities and care for our communities. It's going to be great, but be here at seven. Um, there are just a couple more spots left for voting and farming if you manage to get up there early. So you can check um, that table as you need. Um, today at lunch, um, there may be other tabletops. I didn't check, um, so check those on your way out. There is at least one that I know that will be featured. Nina Orville is in here? Not yet. Um, she works for a group called Abundant Efficiency, and they've been engaged in a campaign that's called Solarize Your Congregation. So if you are interested in putting solar panels on your church building, um, she's a great person to talk to, and she's going to host a tabletop over lunch in conference room B, so you can hear each other a little bit better. Um, so you can grab a plate and then just bring it to conference room B, which we can help you get there if you don't know where it is. And I think that may be it. Oh, we don't want you to leave, but <laughs> if you are planning to leave and using Stony Point Center transportation, we need to know how you're leaving. Um, and if you need our help. So if you could stop by the front desk today, if you don't have that already scheduled, and let us know, that'd be great. That's it. Um, I'm going to invite Sue Smith up for a brief announcement. Um, I said brief. Brief. I did say brief. Wait a second. We Um, hi, my name is Sue Smith, and uh, for purposes of this, I am a member of the uh, Advisory Committee on Social Witness Policy. Yeah. And at the last General Assembly, we were tasked with writing an energy policy. We already have pretty good energy policies, so what we're writing is a resolution that builds on top of that. Um, and so I have copies, it's in a draft form now where we are looking for comments. I know I handed it out to a lot of people as they registered, but if you came in later, um, there's a lot of copies and comments from the on, there, on the table. Um, and so all I'll say that is what we're really trying to do is show the intersection of environmental, racial, and economic justice, as well as plug some smaller holes, like we really have no clear policy right now to say no fracking. So things like that are added to. So we're really just looking for comments. Um, I'm going to try, say, on Thursday, it's two and four on the around in the dining hall or a picnic table, depending on whether um, if anybody wants to talk to it and my email is on the front page if you want to send something to it. Thank you. So we'll transition now to our morning plenary. I'm gonna ask Abby Mohawk to come forward. Um most of the we have one do it. We have a teeny tiny center in worship for 10 or 15 minutes. There you gotta get centered. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well done. So I do indeed invite us to take a deep centering breath. <laughs> As we spend a little time in worship. <laughs> Thank you. 
sleep well. I hope you sleep. This is a, a bit of a, a chance to can't be both of us. It says, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, join with all creation in your praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Baby, Spirit fill our days. Right So during the centering worship moments this morning and tomorrow morning, we want you to hear a piece of the text that frames uh, our thoughts on the arc of this day, both in keynote and throughout. And on this day, for our holy listening time, I want you to hear a reading from the 37th chapter of Ezekiel. It's a story familiar to many, I imagine, the story of the Valley of the Dry Bones. And we sort of begin this day here as a way to acknowledge the depths of dryness and brokenness and death and suffering that are realities of our commitments to environmental justice seeking. This is a day to see the realities and challenges that face us and to lament. So we want to sit in that over the course of the day, uh, especially as we move in the direction of hearing tonight about the psychological impact of climate change and move toward evening prayer. So uh, I invite you to imagine that as the arc of this day. We'll move again toward uh, God's vision in the coming days, but for this day, we felt like we needed some space to pay attention to the difficulties of where we are. So for this holy listening period, you'll hear the story read twice. This first time, I invite you simply to listen afresh and anew to the story itself. Hear God's word. <clears throat> the hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me around them. 
There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, mortal, can these bones live? I answered, oh, Lord God, you do know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded. And as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and the skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God. Come from the four winds, and O oh breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. And I prophesied as he commanded me. And the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O oh my people. And I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O oh my people, I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. Holy wisdom, holy word. So in this second reading, I invite you to listen for a word or phrase that speaks to you. What is it that God might be drawing you to in this passage this morning? It might be a word or phrase that sparkles or shimmers if you're a visual person. So I invite you to hear again this text and to listen for God's guidance and God's intention for you from it this morning. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, it was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded and as I prophesied, suddenly there was noise, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked and there were sinews on them and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. 
And I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy to them, thus says the Lord God, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O oh my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O oh my people. I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. And I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. So now I'll invite us into a time of prayer, and in this prayer, I want for us to remember that uh, though we are good Presbyterians and we use our brains, we also have hearts and bodies to engage our faith with as well. So I'll invite us together into a time of prayer. Uh, you can do this body prayer either standing or sitting as you feel comfortable. Uh, the motions and movements will primarily be based in your hands and your arms. You may want a little space to spread out because there is an arm spreading motion. Uh, so just be mindful of your neighbor. But I invite you to take whatever prayer posture is most comfortable to you. So I'll describe these motions as we go, and there will be uh, an embodied motion followed by a prayerful petition, and then a new motion and a new petition. I think you'll catch on relatively easy. So if you are one who likes to pray with your eyes closed, 
uh, after we assume the prayerful motion, you are welcome to do that. And there will be a cue, and I'll also describe for you the motions as we pray. So let us join our whole selves in prayer. We begin with our palms together in front of our chest. And we pray, God of grace, we give you thanks for the blessings of our lives, for laughter and for play, for beloved community, for this time and place to nurture our faith and inspire our work. May we be grateful people. We reach our hands down toward the ground and we pray spirit of shalom. We root ourselves in your presence, trusting that you are always with us, providing for our needs, calling us to act in compassion and love, leading us to seek justice and peace. May we be reconciling people. We hold, fold our hands over our chests and we pray, Christ of love, we lift up all those we hold in our hearts for those who need your comfort and your healing presence, for those without food or shelter, for those who face fear and violence for those who grieve and feel lost. May we be servant people. And now we stretch our arms out wide and we pray God of hope. We seek to be sources of your dream for the world. Inspire us to open our arms wide in welcome to all. Show us the way to bring newness where there's complacency and unity where there's discord. Teach us to take your table of welcome to all the world. May we be generous people. Finally, we lower our hands to our waists with our palms upturned, praying spirit of the living God fall afresh on us indeed, trusting in your grace and confident that you bring life where there was death and joy where there was weeping, we lift these and all our prayers to you. May we be faithful people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So now we'll shift gears and we'll pass a mic to Bill. And get his laptop queued up. <laughs> this would actually be the time that Abby Little Hoff is coming up. I have my new office to me. Hold in mind the hurting cats image. Um, Abby is uh, a former, not Abby, um, Abby's a former member of the steering committee, uh, currently moderator for Fossil Free Peace USA. Um, you haven't known Abby until you walked uh, part of the journey with her from Louisville to um, St. Louis last year as uh, part of the uh, walk to try to steer our denomination and for what some of us think the more faithful directions of Abby. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So it's my gift to end this morning. Dr. William P. Brown is the William Marcellus Smith 
Peters Professor of Old Testament at Columbia, and um, he will be speaking to us about the Old Testament and ecology, and I bet that it will be beautiful and brilliant as everything Bill does. <laughs> So we were doing some body movements together, and there's one movement I'd like to invite you to. And I want you to place your hands on your ears and hold them really, really tight. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Well done. Well done. I it is my delight to be here with you for this uh, PPC conference here at Stony Point. This is my first time here, and I know there's for many of you as well. Some of you are veterans of Stony Point. Many of you have been involved with the Presidential Earth Care Organization over the years, and uh, I thank you for that. Uh, it is my pleasure also to bring greetings from Bruce Gillette. I talked to him yesterday afternoon as he was traveling from Rochester back home and telling me that uh, so far, so good. Uh, his prognosis is good. And I asked him what words he'd like to share with you all this morning. And he, so he shared a hope, and that hope is that uh, these next few days you will be able to nurture your passion within you, your love for creation, a sense of welfare and well-being, and fear, anxiety, pain, and despair, that you take care of yourself here, as well as you find new pathways for action. So he said, don't forget the inner, but don't forget the outward either, hold them together. And so I think those are true words of wisdom. I also give you greetings from Columbia Theological Seminary. And as Abby said, we are a proud member of the uh, participating, um, evolving uh, Green Seminary Initiative program for our school and for 10 other schools. And I'd also like to introduce just very briefly a guest with us. Um, and it's someone who surprised me when I came here two days ago to decompress after Baltimore uh, and Big Ten. And uh, I never thought I would actually meet him face to face, but he is actually a member of the community here. One of my heroes in Old Testament Hebrew Bible scholarship, and that is Professor Norman Gothwald, who is sitting right here, uh, here to perhaps keep me honest uh, this morning. <laughs> but uh, for some of you may remember, uh, he wrote a phenomenally revolutionary text, a study of the origins of ancient Israel back in 1974, I believe it was, called The Tribes of Yahweh, in which he argued for a new model of understanding early, early Israel as a, um, as a model of revolution in the land of Canaan, uh, which has uh, uh, dramatically changed the course of scholarship, historical, literary, and theological. So I am very glad and honored that, that Norman is here with us uh, as well. So I am a biblical scholar, um, which means that I get paid to read the Bible, <laughs> which is my only difference, perhaps, for most of you. Uh, and um, I had this image of biblical interpretation that I think fits very well with what we're doing uh, today and tomorrow and the next day. And that is my role as a biblical interpreter as an exegete, is to facilitate the move from what I call text to table. So we have farm to table here. Now you have text to table. And for me, that table is a round table in which everyone has a place to sit on all of our diversity. And the bigger, the better, the more diverse, the better. And so it's not just studying the ancient roots of ancient scripture, but it's also moving the text towards relevance and, um, and life for us today in our various communities and in our time together. And so think of ourselves now as around the table. We are somewhere around together, and the table is also a bigger 
and our stones represent us as they are situated on the banks of this river, the river of life. So may the ancient text of the Bible be a living, glowing, life-giving text as well. So, in consonance with the text from Ezekiel, in which the prophet Ezekiel is called upon to prophesy to these dry bones, representing ancient Israel in a time of despair and hopelessness, in a time of lament. And we come here this morning, to Stony Point, in, in lament. And we have so many reasons to lament, from the mass shootings in El Paso and Dayton, to the mass extinctions of biological species that are unprecedented since the time that humans entered into the Colosseum of our Earth's history. So in lament we come, and in lament we express our grief, our anger, our fear, along with hope, looking towards joy. And so I want to select a text, show you a text that uh, requires my password, <laughs> yeah, from the, the question, can these bones live? I want to ask the question, can earth species thrive? And I want to introduce another text, a psalmic text, that gives us a vision. Because every lament assumes a vision of what should be, of what will be, but is not yet. And so lament thrives in that disparity between the now and the not yet, or between what is and what should be. And Psalm 104 provides that vision that is filled with water, and breath and flourishing in diversity. So I want to pick up on a line that uh, was, uh, was sort of a refrain of Lindsay's sermon last night, and that is, all flourishing is mutual. And Psalm 104 is a beautifully poetic evocative rendering of this claim that all flourishing is mutual. So, Feel free to close your eyes, or if you want to look at the screen to see the visual uh, as well. I'm going to read Psalm 104, and I want you to listen for the role of water and breath and the manifold nature of life itself. Psalm 104. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O oh Lord my God, you are exceedingly great. Clothed are you with honor and majesty. You enwrap yourself with light as with a garment. You unfurl the heavens as a curtain. You set the rafters of your chambers upon the waters. You make the clouds your chariot. You move about on the wings of the wind. You make the winds your messengers. Fire and flame are your ministers. You establish the earth upon its foundation, so that it shall never, ever totter. As for the deep, its covering was like clothing. Its water stood over the mountains. At your blast, they took to flight. At the sound of your thunder, they fled with fright. With mountains rising and valleys sinking to the place that you established for them, Boundary you set, they shall not pass. Thus, they shall never again cover the land. You send forth springs into the wadis, between the mountains they flow, giving drink to every wild animal, breaking the onagers of their thirst. Beside the springs, the birds of the heavens make their home, raising their voices among the foliage. You water the mountains from your lofty abodes. From the fruit of your hands, the earth is well satisfied. You make the grass grow for cattle, 
and plants for human cultivation to bring forth food from the earth. Wine, which cheers the human heart, oil, which makes the face shine, and bread, which sustains the human heart. The trees of the Lord are well watered, the cedars of Lebanon, which the Lord has planted, where the birds make their nests. The stork has its home in the junipers. The high mountains belong to the mountain goats. The crags are refuge for the conies. You made the moon for its seasons, the sun to know its time for setting. You bring on the darkness and it is night. In it creeps every animal of the forest. The young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they withdraw. And to their dens, they retire. Humans go forth to their work, to their labor until evening. How manifold are your works, O Lord! You have made them all in wisdom. The earth is stock full of your, all your creatures. There is the sea, both vast and wide. There are creeping things beyond count, living things, small and great. There go the ships, and there is Leviathan with which you fashioned the clay. All of them wait for you to provide their food in due time. You give to them, and they gather it up. You open your hand, and they are well satisfied. But when you hide your face, they are terrified. You take away their breath, and they expire, returning to their dust. But you send back your breath, and they are recreated. You renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in creation. You look at the earth and it trembles. You touch the mountains and they erupt in smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I have life. I will sing praise to my God while I still live. May my meditation be pleasing to the Lord. And I shall rejoice in the Lord. And may sinners cease from the earth and the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. This psalm is a whole bodied celebration of the diversity of creation itself. In fact, I would say that the thesis of the psalm is in Psalm, verse 24, how manifold, how many, how diverse are your works, and wisdom you have made them all, the earth is stock full of your creatures. So the psalm celebrates the flourishing of diversity and fullness of life. This is a gift from God. This is the vision. And this is what the ancient psalmist sees. Now, when John Calvin commented on this psalm, he had one favorite verse. Can you guess what verse that was John Calvin's favorite <laughs> verse? <laughs> Are we ready? Here it is. Why? <laughs> That's right. He's, he's still more ink on this verse than any other verse. 30% devoted to celebrating the gift of wine. 70% on the uh, on moderation. So as you would expect. <laughs> yeah, this was this was this was the verse that focused this attention. That not only is creation for our sustenance, but also for our enjoyment. That was his, that was his point. Creation is to be savored and enjoyed and celebrated. In addition to be thankful for its sustaining power in our lives. But I want to point out to you what this psalm does that no other psalm does. Something quite unique about Psalm 104. And it is this. Psalm 131 commands God to enjoy creation. You don't find that anywhere else in the Psalter, anywhere else in the Bible. So the psalmist has the audacity to call God to account, as many other psalms do, calling God to account for the sake of justice. But 
here to account for the sake of joy. And so the whole psalm hangs as the psalmist's meditation. May my meditation be pleasing to the Lord. The psalm is giving reason for why God should enjoy creation. That is, those reasons are creation's diversity. And one of those creations is Leviathan. A creature that anywhere else is a monster of chaos. And then there's this ending to the song that uh, causes us to erupt in laughter. A sinner cease from the earth, and the wicked do no more. I don't know about you, but for many, many years, when I came to that last verse, that spoiled the song. <laughs> this was the blemish that marred the song. And I wanted to say, out, out, damn spot. <laughs> but it's there. But the last few years, I've come to appreciate this last verse. <laughs> Let me say why. <laughs> uh, so you have the song celebrating the beauty, majesty, fullness and diversity of life itself as reason for God, as warrant for God to enjoy creation. This is all about God's joy to the world. It's as if the psalmist kind of snuck it in there at the end. By the way, God, if you want this, if you want to make this, this creation perfect, wipe out the wicked. Please. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> so here's, here's my rationale that I've come to. And it may work for you, it may not. But uh, any creation account, any creation account in the Bible, perhaps any creation account in modern science as well, has to account for chaos. Where is chaos to be placed? How how much of a poor reign this chaos has. So every ancient creation account has to address that issue because chaos is here. And what the psalmist does is something quite radical. Because traditionally, there is a source of chaos that runs rampant in creation. It comes in various forms. But in certain creation accounts, like Psalm 74, it's embodied by this creature called Leviathan. Psalm 74, Leviathan is slated for destruction by God and then hung out to dry in the desert where the birds pray to eat up its carcass. Or in Isaiah 27, verse 1, Leviathan is to be slain at the end times, this monster, this, this combatant against God. On the other hand, in Genesis 1, we have in verse 21 the reference to, and so God created the great sea monsters, which, with which the waters produced swarms of, and God said, very good. God said, very good. So in, the, in Genesis 1, the very first creation account, the great sea monsters are considered good. And uh, it reminds me of a story of a colleague of mine who read chapter one to his two young boys, five and seven years old. And when he got to verse 21, so God created the great sea monster. The younger one whispered to the older one, that was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> According to Genesis, even the sea monsters are not mistakes of God, they are part of God's new creation. And in Psalm 104, every bit of fearful chaos is, is divested from this monster called Leviathan to the point that Leviathan becomes God's playmate. Or as one Jewish biblical scholar once said, Leviathan becomes God's rubber duck. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do with chaos? If it's not Leviathan, where do you place chaos? May sinners cease from the earth and the wicked be 
the psalmist is doing is placing chaos upon our shoulders. We are the promulgators, the purveyors of chaos. Whereas I cannot pray this final verse. This verse does cause me to look at myself in the mirror and ask myself, am I a purveyor of chaos? Or do I embody the kind of agency that works towards the healing of the people? And so I find that particularly profound. And that's how I have, uh, that's how I have made peace with this last verse of Psalm 100. Sometimes I still want to throw it out. If I could excise that, erase that from the psalm, I would have to it. But it's there. And it stares at me as I look at it. But we are the purveyors of chaos, according to the psalm. Not the most fearsome beasts of the wild, and the psalmist I, we are. We are the embodiment of cruelty and savagery. So, so Psalm 104 is a song of praise, but it has that sort of lament at the end, and that's where we begin. And as uh, Ruth Gillette has asked us to, to be attentive to both the inner and the outer, what is inside of us and what is out there in terms of our service to the world. So we are embodying a movement from lament to hope and to vision. But as to lament, you have to have that vision already. If you did not have this vision, you would not be lamenting right now. And so Psalm 104 gives us that vision with that indie note of lament. If you're a to explore a bit more fully. And so as the psalmist celebrates the diversity of creation and names a number of species, from lions to leviathan, onagers and storks. In fact, I don't know if you noticed, but the only difference between the lion and the human being is that the lion takes the night shift <laughs> and we take the day shift. That's the only difference. The lion goes out at night to earn its living and retires back to its den. And now we go out to earn our living during the day. And then we come home in the evening. And so you have this rhythm of creation. There's a harmony here that the psalmist celebrates as well. Every species has its niche, its place, and timing to go with it. So, as we move back into lament with this vision in mind, I want us, I invite you, to consider those species that have gone extinct in recent years, knowing that more species are going extinct in the years to come. And so this is sort of the counterpart to Psalm 104. Okay, it's going to with some music as well, and so it's going to it's going to start abruptly. So you may want to put your hands over your ears. <laughs>
loss of species in our world at an unprecedented rate is one occasion for all. And all that I can do is to give tribute to those species, knowing that with the death of every species, as E.O. Wilson once said, is every species is a universe unto itself, a world. A world full of birth and death, of baby rituals, of relationships, a world of culture and community. With every extension, a universe passes away. My friends, our birth is a multiverse, and it is diminishing. And if if it, is, if it is the diversity of life that gives God joy, as the psalmist wants to elicit from God by presenting to God the manifold nature of life, if God's joy rests on the diversity of life, what is God feeling now? This is the flip side of the psalm as we move from praise to lament. Scientists speak of tipping points, the threshold that is crossed, that is irrevocable, that signifies, that initiates these amplifying feedback loops that are destructive. And we are passing through, we are causing some of those tipping points today. Is there a tipping point in God's joy that turns God's joy into sorrow? perhaps even to anger. In any case, the psalm poses the question, what does extinction do to God's joy? At the very least, God's joy to the world is diminished at an unprecedented rate. So the vision of the flourishing of life and all of its mutuality there in the psalm and elsewhere in scripture, and that flourishing being diminished in part by our own actions. What does that do to God's joy? And what does that do to our hope? Well, from lament, I want to move slightly into hope before we do so more fully tomorrow. And I want to introduce to you 
Um, uh, we don't have time for confession, I'm sorry to say. Except we do have a little time for confession. Let's do that. Okay. Yeah, I know we're, we're running late. So let's confess, and then I want to introduce to you a sign of hope. So if you could read for me the yellow parts, and I'll read the white parts, and we'll read together in confession. Oh God, time and space. We confess we are running out of hope. Species were running into extinction, as the matter before. Habitat created over millennia, destroyed in the blink of an eye. Sea levels rising, threatening, moving closer. While the poor and the voiceless taste the bitter salt, drink the poisoned water, and smell the toxic fumes. Oh God, time and space. We confess we are running out of hope. O oh God, hope and resurrection. We tremble on the brink of utter despair. O oh God, a transformation. We confess the shift we call. Because it is easier. Because it hurts too much to care. Because we don't want to give up what we have. Because we are afraid. O oh God, a deep sign. These are our prayers. We know it is not only from you we need to ask forgiveness, but from all your creation, extinct and endangered. You polar bears, forgive us, we pray. You coral reefs, forgive us, we pray. You black rhinos and orangutans, forgive us, we pray. You monarch butterflies, ivory hooded woodpeckers, and gray wolves, forgive us, we pray. O oh, air that we breathe, forgive us, we pray. O oh, oceans that give us life, forgive us, we pray. O oh, mountaintops of Appalachia, forgive us, we pray. Remake us, O oh, Creator and Redeemer. Transform us into a new creation. Open us to your love, which can open our eyes and our hearts. Give us courage to walk in your path to all creation. Forgive us and make us free for hope and for healing for all the world. Amen. So finally, I want to introduce to you the work of a young woman in Indonesia. Uh, her name is Ella. And she was raised in a white middle class family. She received a heavy dose of religion as she was growing up. And she renounced all that. Um, as she ventured forth into college and then started experiencing through a semester of rock programs from Argentina, Fiji, Thailand, she got a taste of the world in its intercultural diversity. She ended up with a degree in astrophysics. <laughs> but then she decided she was more in love with animals than with the stars. <clears throat> and so she took an extra year focusing on biology and animals. And now in Indonesia, um, on the island of Borneo, uh, she is studying two primates, orangutans and the slow lords, both of which are in danger because of palm oil plantation. And uh, particularly for the slow lords, uh, in fact, here's a slow lords. Um, captured as pets, it's the only primate on this planet that has a poisonous spike. Huh. Yeah, and and so they are captured as pets because they are so cute, as you can testify. And they pull out their teeth, uh, keep them in cages, and then when they're tired of them, they just they let them loose, and of course they die. And so the slow loris is endangered because of the poaching and pet trade, as well as uh, plantation expansion, as well as, well as the orangutan. And uh, in fact, this slow loris, I went to Indonesia to get acquainted with her work uh, last summer. And um, this, this slow loris is actually occupying one of her bathrooms. As you can see, the PCP hydrant down there in the bathroom. It lives in the forest of Indonesia. Uh, but then they were rehabilitating the slow loris, whose mother was killed and was presented as a baby to them. And they did not, they, what they do is they go out into the wild. To the behavior of these primates. They've never 
received the slow lowers to rehabilitate them. So we've been trying to do that and successfully so. Uh, this slow lowers is named Blah Blah. Yep. Don't ask me why. So I asked Ella, what is it that that brings her to the other side of our world here, to the other side of the world, to be immersed in another culture? Because one thing that she has done for the first six months in doing this, she said she wanted to come back home. And then in that seventh month, something clicked. First of all, she began dreaming in Indonesian. She has now become fluent in Indonesian. And not only does she research these findings, she also goes into elementary schools to talk to children about the importance of wildlife. And so she has totally immersed herself in Indonesian culture. So I asked her, what is it that sustains her as well as has initiated her into this adventure to the front line of endangered species? And she said, when I look into the eyes of the slow lords of the orangutan, I see a creature that is full of life and dignity. And I also see a little bit of something of myself. I see a connection. I feel a connection. I see something of myself. I can't but help them that her work and organizations, whether through Boston University, Orangutans, or the Little Fireplace Project from Oxford Brooks University in the UK, that this kind of work, and in getting to know Ella's work, I've noted that there's so many other young people who have done this as well and are doing this, that this gives a little bit more joy to come up. And I'm also proud to say that Ella is our daughter. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if she'll ever come back to church. <laughs> but I think she was doing God's work. So, from romance to a little bit of hope as we, as we get in touch with what is most fearful and anxious, provoking, and despairing within us. We begin to look for hopes after we have lamented. Now, as we move outward into workshops that will take us to the front line. So every day we will move from the Bible to the front line as we pray and work for shalom and peace in the earth. So go forth. Thank you.